So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited and uh, humbled that people want to hear about my journey moving from design to construction education. Um, I think it's a very important topic uh, when we consider how architecture can support um, some of the global conversations happening around social justice, equality, um, equal access to education, equal access to economic opportunity and training. Um, and I feel it's, it's really important to me to share that I think architecture has a foundational uh, structure that is helpful to developing dialogue and programs uh, that can do this. Oops, sorry, I'm just having some difficulty. So I'm coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya, uh, which is thousands of miles away. Um, and um, Kenya is a country in, Eastern, in the Eastern uh, side of the continent. Um, and we are home to about 53 million people. And I'm specifically coming to you from Nairobi, which has about 4.3 million people living in the city. Now, when it comes to post-colonial discourse, Nairobi is a very interesting, Nairobi and Kenya is a very interesting context. Um, we have a lot of failures that we've experienced as a result of post-colonial development. Um, a lot of the time, some of uh, the development structures that the country uh, followed were precedents set during colonialism. For instance, Kibera, shown on your uh, right, top right screen, um, is one of the biggest informal settlements in Nairobi. And if you look at the housing configurations today, they match the same configurations that colonial um, powers and dictators uh, forced Africans to live in. So we've just adopted a lot of the patterns which leads to a very unhealthy development. Um, below, I've also included some of the complexities of the city. It's a rapidly growing city. Uh, housing is a major challenge and there's a lot of unsafe structures coming up. In addition, uh, there's a lot of congestion in the city which leads to spread out um, developments and a lot of traffic. And for me, the, the juxtaposition of the city from, you know, it's supposed to be the green capital of, of, of Kenya uh, with all the congestion that's coming up forces us to take a look at how we're developing and who we're developing for. Now, my personal background is uh, a combination uh, of cultures. I actually went to school in America. I went to school in Washington, DC, University of DC, and then went to uh, University of Arkansas. Um, for my second degree. I then worked for Miller Hall Partnership in Seattle before moving to Johannesburg to work with Peter Rich, Peter Rich Architects. So all of these uh, practices and cultures, you know, had, a, had an impact on me. Um, it had an impact on how I saw myself and how I started to question the contribution to my culture. In addition, um, a major change influenced the way I, I moved in my career. And that change was a transition from commercial architecture. At the top is a project I worked on in Nairobi with Bugatman and Partners, uh, a mall in the city. And at the bottom is the transition I made from commercial architecture into development work. I went to work in Kibera, as I said, one of Nairobi's uh, biggest informal settlements, home to between a quarter million people to about 400,000 people. It's not quite certain because data is conflicting. But overall, a, a place of poverty, um, struggling with basic access to sanitation, access to economic opportunities, access to food, any, any challenge that you would imagine in terms of access and equalities experienced in this context. And this had a major influence in how I approach BuildHer. So uh, this is Anwar, one of the projects I worked on while uh, leading the KDI Kibera office. I worked for Konkui Design Initiative and was the country director managing all aspects of design, construction, and community engagement. And this project, you know, taking what we considered a waste space into a functional productive space. Um, this is uh, a photo during construction of, of the space. It was very, very influential in how I started to think about uh, embracing communities and involving communities in design and construction. Um, at KDI, I learned very amazing and, uh, you know, life-changing processes. I learned how to involve community in participatory processes from design. Uh, we did, we'd have workshops for children, for adults, for the elderly, anybody who would come into contact with this and any other project that we carried out. And we would involve them throughout the process to develop the design. And in addition to, to engaging community, we also engaged youth 
uh, in the construction of the project. So here I'm showing one of the training programs that we run. And in fact, this was my first training program that I launched, uh, training use how to develop um, sustainable uh, components of the building. So we used bamboo and local timber, taught them how to uh, harvest it, taught them how to um, manufacture it and develop it in order to be utilized in making doors and windows. And this whole process taught me that training and involvement in construction was so much more than I understood at the time. So we worked with a, a group of youth, men and, and women to develop these components, teach them about design, teach them how they would approach challenges of manufacturing and developed a, a transition from design, prototyping, uh, building out the components and then installing them on site. And ANWA was one of the foundational programs in my career, uh, not only because we were challenging the material use and, and how to highlight how local materials in a positive, uplifting way for the community members to see that their, their local materials could be used in very innovative ways. But also that um, collaboration throughout the process really taught me what was achievable if we just took time to slow down and move forward together in a process. So this led to a lot of how I approached uh, BuildHer, uh, working with local communities, um, engaging the disadvantaged communities in the, in the community, people who are left out of processes, asking why they were left out, how to include them more, and structuring how we were thinking about training, construction, uh, participatory processes, thinking about all those stages of collaboration from the perspective of people who are usually left out of a process. So Build Her is a result of this uh, accumulated experience. And uh, we are a social enterprise that works to see women across Kenya actively contribute to urban development towards safe, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable cities. Our mission is uh, to empower women through connecting construction and manufacturing skills training to employment. It's not only important to us to train, but to also help introduce women into the process of career development with employers who are willing and invested in nurturing their growth. So we focus on advocacy, accredited construction skills and life skills training to bridge the skills gap and meet the needs of the construction industry while also delivering positive social and economic impact in the process. Women who attend the program are mainly between the ages of 17 to 50. And we used to say 17 to 35, but we have more and more women approaching the program. And for us, if you can, if you can um, manage the intensity that's required, then we are willing to train you. So if a woman above 50 would come, we would still train her. And um, across the board, all the women who look to join us have had challenges accessing education and employment opportunities and have been struggling with the very many difficulties surrounding poverty. And this can include hunger and malnutrition, limited access to basic services, social discrimination and exclusion, as well as the lack of participation in decision-making in their home and in their communities. For many of these women, access to technical training and skilled employment in the construction or otherwise is a safe, dignified and economically sustainable route out of poverty. Now the context of Kenya, just to give us a, a basis of understanding, Kenya is one of the fastest growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa and the construction industry is one of the fastest growing sectors in the country. And you know, I like to think that Kenya has the potential to be one of Africa's success stories, but there are major challenges which slow down our progress, you know, including high rates of poverty and inequality, poor corruption and governance, low productivity and efficiency due to lack of investment in the uh, tools, machinery and processes needed. And there's a, a huge skills gap between the market requirements and education curriculums provided. In addition, the youth demographic make up about 75% of Kenya's population, making access to education and jobs a major priority for the growing youth population. Uh, according to the National Construction Authority, who is the construction regulator in Kenya, there is need for 2 million construction artisans to meet the construction sector demand. So that's 2 million artisans needed to complete the infrastructure. And currently, it's less than 140,000 artisans who are registered. 
um, with women making up less than 3% of the skilled construction workforce. So our proposition is if there's a gap, if women need jobs, then why not marry the two and give women that opportunity? Our solution at Builder is not only to strengthen Africa's economy by giving youth jobs and giving access to training and employment, but to also ensure that our growth is sustainable and inclusive. So to do this, we provide three main approaches. So here I'm showing you the full breakdown, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, condense it into three, three uh, main approaches. The first is to provide access to technical training, education, and routes to employment for vulnerable women in Nairobi. And hopefully, eventually we hope to go out of Nairobi, but for now we are based in Nairobi. We also offer financial support to our trainees to help them continue to care for their children and to meet their, their, um, the, homes, uh, the home demands as they attend the program. We also link our trainees to employment with employers who are ready to support their growth and development. The second approach is to structure a holistic program to address the mental, cultural, emotional, and behavioral barriers, preventing priority groups like youth and women from accessing available opportunities and resources. The third is to ensure industry relevance. And uh, to do this, we engage industry players in identifying industry gaps and needs so that our trainees are work ready and can contribute to site productivity and efficiency from day one. You know, there's a lot of misconception when you talk about women in construction, people think you want to, you know, women to be hired for being women. And for us, it's really important that the women are skilled and valued. And these three main approaches are divided into the seven steps shown here that we tie together with a continuous feedback loop where we gather data through each part of the process to gauge success as well as failure. Failure is really important to us and we gather learning to improve the program. Our training program, uh, it comprises of, sorry, there's some information you're missing here at the top of the screen, but um, it comprises of four months of intensive, intensive technical training and eight months of employment training where women are paid as they continue to learn. 60% of the program is dedicated to technical training, including theory and pra practical hands-on learning, while 40% is dedicated to what we call supportive uh, training. It's life skills training, work readiness training. We do um, nutrition support, mental health support, and physical conditioning. We also offer fam family advisory services, including childcare consultation, where we go into the community and check in on mothers with children under three, because we noticed mothers with this, with this age group of children were really struggling due to malnutrition and, and other, diff and other uh, health ch challenges. And so we stepped in to see how could we advise them so that they could then focus back on their education. We also hold family days where we work with partners and family members of women attending the program and help break negative perceptions and harmful practices that hinder women from attending and succeeding in the program. And we even go beyond that. We have partners who offer legal services for women who go through a traumatic or abusive incident and who need support understanding what their rights are and, and don't have the resources to take the steps needed. And we are open to discovering as many ways as possible um, to understand what women need to succeed in the program. And uh, these are just some of the images that I mentioned. We have mental health coaching. We have uh, community engagement sessions where we meet with our community partners. We work with community-based organizations and NGOs, and we take time to listen to them when they, when they have um, feedback about what is working or not working through the program. We also do life skills. We do peer sessions where uh, at alumni artisans can come back and talk to women to share experiences of what they've gone through and also to give advice of how women can succeed in the program. Currently, we offer painting and decorating uh, as well as carpentry and joinery as two courses. Uh, but because this is rather limiting, we look at, we structure the training in order to provide pathways of employment for women. So that could mean that if you go into carpentry and joinery, we'll take you through machining training as well. Uh, we'll take you through new technologies. Um, on the left hand, you'll see an image of one of our alumni artisans working on C CLT timber construction. So we try to expose women to as many areas as possible within those lines of training. Um, furniture production is another line. 
uh, which we started as an income generating uh, program, which I'll talk about later, but again, offering women you know, options of what they could do with the training that we provide. Now, apart from the training, um, as a design professional, it was also important to me to focus on the space, the spaces that women um, are working in. How could we make our spaces empowering? So the first thing for us was to involve our artisans in the design and construction of the spaces, um, in choosing elements that uh, would help make the space feel more accessible, and also you know, making it exciting for the women to, to be proud to not only have built the space, but to also be trained in, in the center. We looked at the materials used and how to uh, select materials that women could also use in their own uh, you know, manufacturing processes. We encourage women to start selling furniture and other projects in the settlement. And so the technology that we used in construction, as well as the material choices, as well as the colors, everything combined was meant to create <clears throat> an inspiration in the process. And uh, this image is showing uh, the carpentry and, and, and joinery space in particular. And um, some of the things that we considered in the space, how to make it exciting, what materials to use, and how to incorporate women in the process. Um, and not only do we do training, but we also look at how to uh, you know, introduce women to concepts of design, to concepts of material choices. Um, and we also use that information to develop sustainable programs uh, that we can then use to raise money to put back into the, the main training program. So this is an example of some fit out work that Builder has, has, um, has uh, constructed. So we designed and constructed the space with women. We also um, have a furniture line that we, we launched in December of 2020. So we're very excited to have a positive story from COVID. Um, and we launched this furniture line to help us in understanding what it would mean to develop our training to a high level of craft that people, that the ladies who emerge from the program can make high quality joinery. We also wanted to um, go into market with products that would offer uh, an alternative to, you know, furniture items that you would find in the market. So focusing on choice of sustainable timber, how we source our timber, methods of joinery, making sure it's high quality joinery, um, and also a high design aesthetic that would then contribute something positive to the market. And again, for us, product development, prototyping, and manufacturing is conducted with Build Her Women. Um, an example of some of the furniture products that we uh, offer, uh, this is one of the chairs from our line. It's a Muihaki uh, chair. And um, each of the products that we develop have a, have a narrative. We tend to develop the products from projects that emerge from the training. Uh, the earliest prototype of the Muihaki chair was um, actually a product developed with one of the trainees who was such a high performing uh, student that we needed to engage her in challenging activities. And so she um, had asked for a, a challenging project. And the first iteration of the design was a quick study that we did with her on the, pro on the project. And she did such a good job that we ended up not only launching our furniture line from that product, but then continuing that tradition of developing products through participatory processes. Um, in addition, we're also venturing into other areas of work. It's really important to us that uh, we shoot for sustainability. So at the moment, Builder is funded through grant funding. Um, and our aim is as we continue to work with this grant funding, that every year we develop income generating programs that can help us sell products, raise money to reinvest in the pro program, and thereby also reducing the dependency we have on um, funding. And this is really important for the development field and also our understanding of post-colonial work, understanding that the more agency we have, not only in the communities we serve, but in the organizations that we are developing is truly important to sustainability. Now, our work also, apart from the training, apart from uh, the holistic approach to the training that I mentioned, the sustainability measures that we are taking, we also extend our impact into helping women transition to work safely. Some of the barriers to employment um, 
that women face is, you know, secret discriminatory behavior, but also obvious behavior. When we try to place women, employers will often say that women cannot um, carry out uh, certain aspects of work, either because our bodies are too small or our strength is, is not uh, where it should be to manage construction processes. And one of the things we do to address that is we teach different ways that women can handle and manage their bodies, how to work together to carry our heavy loads, believing that together we can be able to overcome most of the challenges that we face on site. Other barriers include high incidence of sexual harassment, uh, lack of gender inclusive policies and protocols, and uh, most tools, equipment, and clothing are actually not designed for a woman's physique. And for all these barriers mentioned, and there's so much more, we try to develop an approach and, and um, a dialogue with employers. For incidents of sexual harassment, we actually have an uh, onboarding uh, program with employer partners. We have an assessment that we conduct where we come in and make sure that the workplaces are safe, the managers are, are well equipped to deal with cases of harassment, and if there are gaps, then we offer our support to help the employers develop those areas. We also look at lack of gender inclusive policies and protocols. A lot of um, policies are, are, are developed very academically um, and not really cater do not really cater to the level of education of a lot of workers in construction. And so we help bridge that gap by creating material policies and protocols to support employers in helping uh, transition women to work. And for tools, equipment and clothing, part of the assessment I mentioned previously is when we go in to, to, to assess employers, we also check on their sizes of clothing and, and recommend, um, you know, suppliers we work with, sizes that we have tried and tested, and where we see that an employer is unable to make a change fast enough. Uh, and by that, I mean, the change can be made in time to onboard women into the project. If they are unable to do it, then we go out and we just buy it for the women and support them in transitioning to work. So our current impact, um, we have now trained 194 women in construction skills. Not all women who come to us are crazy about construction and we understand that. So we help women transition to other types of employment. Some women go into business after our program because they feel empowered to do so. Some go and work into, in, in related sectors, but we're very proud that 111 women are so far con continuing to develop careers in construction. We are, we are dedicated to collect data on every woman who goes into the program. For us, it's really important to understand once you graduate, what are you doing and how much are you earning? And we are so excited because one of the key metrics of our impact, <clears throat> sorry, is that women report a 530% increase in income after the four months of training, whether they transition to construction with our employer partners or they are self-placed, meaning they look for work themselves, or they go into other areas of work, women who earned less than $3 a day inconsistently are now reporting earning seven to $10 per day consistently. And that's a huge metric for us. In addition, we indirectly have impacted 4,000 uh, beneficiaries, whether it's the family of direct family members, extended family members of the women in the program or employer partners and their employees on site. And for us, it's um, one of the things we, we like to speak about is the impact of one woman. When you help one woman transition into sustainable employment, the minimum number of people who benefit from that change is four people. So each woman in our program is supporting four to 10 people, whether directly in her nuclear family or extended. And this is huge for us because this is a way to scale in um, poverty eradication. One way to do this is focusing on women and the impact that women provide to communities. Another metric that we're really proud of is 95% of the women who attend the program have an increase in confidence and agency, meaning they're taking more uh, leadership in their homes, more le leadership of their life choices, and that just results in you know, better family dynamics and better individual uh, success. We also see that 83% of our employer partners, and to date we have about 20 active employer partners, uh, and we have the, about uh, maybe even 20 more, uh, 19 or 20 more employers who we engage with advocacy and in preparation to onboard women at a later date. But out of the employ employers who do 
hire women, we see that 83% of them uh, incorporate gender, sexual harassment and dignified uh, policies and dignified pay. And dignified pay is a huge one for us because this is one of the challenges that we do not compromise on, ensuring that women get equal pay for equal work. And some of the key learnings through our process, um, because it is very difficult work, has been one with the holistic approach there is a burden of cost because there's, you know, it's, a, it's an endless exploration on how many things are needed to support uh, disadvantaged or disenfranchised groups from transitioning into successful uh, lives. And one of the things that we, we do to tackle this is developing partnerships with NGOs and other community-based organizations so that we don't have to pay out of pocket for all our support programs, but that we work with um, partners who can step in and support women. Um, other learnings are that some of the traumatic challenges that uh, women face and youth and people overall who grow up in environments of poverty face so many traumatic incidents that there has to be care and attention given to that. And a lot of the time when we speak to other TVET um, providers, which is technical vocational training providers, into why their trainees are not, whether, men, whether they're men or women, why their trainees are not transitioning to work as successfully as um, anticipated. One of the things we try to talk about is a lot of the trauma that is experienced from a poverty background cannot be solved with technical training. And so one of the things that we're really happy to see is more and more uh, programs developing mental health support and um, you know, trauma support to help communities be able to transition. Other, other challenges we see, which we are not able to address, address directly currently, is the process of transitioning women to work is actually very challenging when it comes to a cultural background. So Kenya is very traditional. We have, so we have about 40 different ethnic groups in one country with 53 million people. And each of these ethnic groups have different practices, different customs, which are often very traditional. And so when it comes to empowerment and to transitioning women to work, one of the things we don't see being discussed enough is what, what, is, what is needed to help women bear the uh, disproportionate level of, of care that women tend to um, carry for the, for the home. And this can look like women supporting the elderly, women supporting their children, women bearing the um, financial burden when their partners aren't working. Just there's a lot of responsi responsibility placed on women. And so one of the things we're currently looking to do is to create advocacy programs, whether on, national, on a local radio or local discussions in the community about um, the barriers and challenges of women successfully transitioning to work and what is needed in terms of better distribution of childcare, better distribution of home care to en enable women to do this. And um, one of the things that we find is uh, people always ask uh, why women, you know, especially in a traditional culture like Kenya, um, why build our focuses on women? And our, our response, apart from the fact that we think focusing on women is a credible use of our time, is that most of the TVET schools in the city actually focus on men. If you go to other technical training um, programs, institutions, centers, you'll notice a ratio of one woman to 15 or 20 or 30 men. And for us, the question was, why is this the case? Why don't women feel included? Why don't they feel like they are, um, they have you know, a right to be in these spaces? And to use that challenge as a source of inspiration in how we develop the program. So that's all I have. I knew I would take less than 40 minutes, um, but I would invite you and your friends uh, to support us. You can visit our website um, to check the different ways that you can support us. But in addition, just tuning into our work on some of our social media channels, spreading the word, posting on and sharing with your friends is also a great way to just raise awareness on all the things I've talked about that Build Her is doing, all the questions that we're asking and, um, also a way for us to link to other partners to continue to do the work that we believe in. So thank you so much. Um, that's all I have. And I'm open to questions from this point.
virtual clappings and uh, yeah, I'm sure that the people in the, that they are together in the hall are, are, are clapping too. Um, thank you so much, Tatu, for, for this really great talk and, and really inspiring work, uh, which is, I mean, we, we, we all have so much uh, to learn from. Um, I have my own questions, but I wonder if there are, other, before barging in, um, I, I wonder if there are others uh, in the audience who would like to ask uh, first and yeah, and then I'll wait patiently. <laughs> I think um, probably the best way to structure this, because I presume there will be people in the classroom who want to ask questions as well. Um, perhaps um, we have one question already in the Q&A. Um, what I'll do is um, for those of you uh, who want to pose a question, we'll alternate between the classroom and those on Zoom. Um, if you've posted a question into the Q&A, um, with your permission, of course, I will um, allow you to um, to join the panelists um, so that you could present your question in person. I think that's probably the most fluid way of doing it. Um, and for the rest of you, um, if you're if you come up with a question later on, um, if you raise your hands, perhaps we can we can do that that way as well. Um, just to let you know that the, um, the session is still recording um, and we'll be posting this online. So if you'd rather not be present in the recording, um, perhaps post your question to the Q and A, and I can read it out for you. Um, what I'll do now also is um, share our um, poster, uh, well, we can do this later on, I'll share our poster um, for the upcoming events for the rest of the term, um, if you'd like to join. At the end. Yeah. So our first question, uh, thank you very much, is from Daria. Um, I will um, see if I can add you to the um, to the panelists group. So feel free to unmute and turn on your video if you'd like. Otherwise I'll- Maybe just, yeah. Go yeah, ahead, but, otherwise but, but, I'll maybe go Maybe we can, we can just read the questions, yeah. Yes. I think it would. So Dara's question, um, I'll read it out in full. She says, thank you so much for sharing your incredible work. The build her furniture chairs are really beautiful and remind me of the relationship the Bauhaus School set up for student design products to be manufactured in industry. I wanted to ask about the barriers to employment. What has your experience been getting in, um, been in getting figures in, in, in the industry to review and reimagine the construction industry? Is there enthusiasm to change and reconsider industry level practices? Should I answer one by one? Uh, yes, one by one. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so great question, uh, Daria, and thank you for that. Um, there is uh, a lot of uh, resistance to change <laughs> in construction. And I don't think this is just in Kenya. I think this is a across the world. Um, even when I worked in the US, you know, contractors just have a set way which helps them ensure their bottom line, uh, that they can recover cost and make a profit. And so they don't want to change. Same condition here in Kenya. Um, what we are seeing, though, is there's a change of conversation in terms of uh, how companies conduct themselves and how they do work that's trickling down to the construction levels. So this includes uh, the SDGs, Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals. Many companies are working to, to meet those in their practices. And it also includes uh, ESG standards, which is environmental, uh, social and governance uh, standards that most companies are trying to align to, to show best practice. And part of the environmental and social uh, targets include incorporating um, disempowered and disadvantaged groups. And so that kind of conversation we are seeing is actually driving the conversation and steps uh, that are required forward. Um, and also creating a conversation around gender. Um, for instance, uh, the National Construction Authority, who is one of our partners, has you know, expressed to us that they, they, they actually don't know how to incorporate women and they don't know what's needed. They don't know what, what kind of conversation to have with their members. And so that's an entry point for us to come in and share our knowledge, share our data that shows women are not only capable of meeting the industry demands, but are also surpassing industry demands because of some of the personal reasons that drive their work, but also some of the characteristics of women like more collaborative um, working, or more attention to detail. These are great things for uh, construction. 
And so that conversation is, is slowly but surely pushing us forward, um, but it's a struggle. Thank you very much, Tatu. I'm just gonna check with those in the classroom to see if there are any comments or questions from, from those joining us in person. It's a bit awkward, this um, hybrid situation we're trying to... <laughs> Yeah, we are we are still experimenting, uh, really appreciating this kind of global conversations, but try to make them local too. So yes, <laughs> this is part of the experimentation. Hi, Tatu, thank you so much. That was a uh, wonderful uh, discovering about your social enterprise. I was wondering if you could explain more of uh, your business model. You mentioned that part of your part of your funds is coming from grants. Is the other part just sales? Uh, do you have any other sources of income? Is your, do you have a plan to like change? What's the proportion? Are you changing the, the proportions that are coming like through private income or more grants? Uh, yeah, if you could discuss more, talk about a bit more about your um, financial model, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so our model was actually interrupted by COVID like most things. <laughs> So we had to uh, restructure our thinking. Uh, but generally, the approach we've taken is that we are reliant on grant funding for a minimum of the first five years. So we, we started in 2019 and at that point had a five-year trajectory. COVID hit and we reset and have started the five years again in 2021. And so um, the, the idea is in these five years, as we're reliant on a majority of it being foreign grant funding, but we're very happy that we have uh, local um, contractors and developers uh, already um, funding us. So that's a, a positive sign of relevance. But during these five years, we are prototyping different um, entrepreneurship programs. So we launched the furniture line in December, uh, did our prototype, uh, we did a prototype development for the products and then prototype to going to market. Um, we were able to sell products and see our challenges, challenges in the production process, material source, sourcing, supply chain issues. And so we, we took a stop in um, this month in October and are going to resume. We're, we're, we're changing a lot of our operations to resume uh, the business in December. And then again, observe it for a year to see if we can make changes. Um, we also are introducing new furniture streams uh, like the kitchen cabinetry. We prototyped that. And uh, from January, we'll be taking orders from individual clients. We'll be online available to come um, do kitchens, but we will limit that to a couple of kitchens a month until we are sure how we can manage it, observe our return on investment, see if it's a, vi uh, a viable source of income and then shift. So the idea is we'll keep doing this for five years. And after five years, have to successfully um, launch two to three businesses tied to the areas of training that we are uh, conducting now. Um, and at that point, we are hoping that the income we earn will be able to pay for 25% of the program. If we can do more, that will be great, but 25 already is quite ambitious. And then from there, year on year, we'll just look to, to level that out increase the income coming into businesses, reduce the dependency on funding. Uh, but I should add that we foresee that at least 20 to 25% of the program will always be reliant on grant funding because of the social services and programs I mentioned. It's just, they're, they're expensive and they're ever evolving according to the needs of women. And so our target is to, to be okay with taking some grant funding, but having but have developed some local sources of grant funding by then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatu. Um, we have one more question from the um, Q and A chat, um, which is from Melissa, and she asks, um, "How did your architectural education in the United States help or hinder your discussion in creating Build Her?" Um, I think it was paramount <laughs> to me landing here. Um, and it, was, it wasn't just the education, it was the experience. So uh, one of the negative experiences was before I left Kenya, I didn't think I was black. I didn't think I was a other. I didn't think I was a minority. <clears throat> I didn't think that my, <clears throat> my race could hinder me uh, or propel me forward, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively. 
Um, and so this really opened my eyes to social justice and framed my understanding of inequity and also um, just disadvantaged groups, but also just minority groups. And I think that lens has helped me come back home and look at what those structures are in my own culture. And then um, with design, I think a positive impact for me was just how wide my, my perspective was um, allowed to develop into because of the education. Um, the fact that I moved from city to city, you know, people think America is homogeneous, but when you live there, you're like, it's very different in every city and every part of the country. In addition, I did a study abroad uh, period in Italy. That was beautiful because I got to visit, I got to live in Italy. I got to visit beautiful buildings every day, um, sometimes get drunk in piazzas and just sit around buildings. And just that freedom to see the world because I also traveled a lot in Europe then enabled me to come back to America thinking differently, uh, develop uh, questions that then led me to, to want to participate in regionalism and empowerment. Thank you for that. Fantastic. Um, are there any more questions from the classroom? Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just, towards the end, you talked about how it's not um, spoken enough about how women bear like disproportionate amounts of care labor. And I was just wondering if you could expand upon the bit more of the specific things you do within build her for the women you, you are training to mitigate I'm, I'm assuming their yeah disproportionate um responsibility for care labor that they perform sure thank you um i'm not sure if you're also sophia i think sophia is a person who's <laughs> so thank you yeah that um, was ellie <laughs> okay thank you ellie um so one of the things we do is we talk about the practical things you need to do to leave home early now in kenyan culture majority of home care is is delegated to women that is cooking cleaning anything domestic is delegated to women so you can imagine if you have four to five children what time do you need to wake up to prepare food what do you need to leave for them to be able to go uh, to, to school if they need to or if it's daycare, how do you um, take them to the daycare or have the person who's supporting you with daycare come home? Just very practical advice um, is given to trainees. And what we do is we invite other women in the program to come and give the advice of what they do and how they're making it work out for them. Uh, we also invite other women in you know, sometimes related or unrelated fields of the same demographic to come and talk about that experience of what you need to do in the home in order to leave for work. Um, the second thing I would say we do is our lines are always open. And this was a move I think was very beneficial to the conversation. If any partner, husband, or you know, support system of the women in the program need to talk things out, um, we are open to just talking with them. And we've had men call us because um, they, are, they are struggling because uh, what they need to do to balance home care is would cause them uh, to be ridiculed in their society and culture. Um, so they don't want to be ridiculed by community and they don't quite know how to, to withstand that and support their partner. And so we actually take their calls and sometimes teams, members of the team of the Build Her team go visit to discuss ways that you could do things without causing too much uh, of uh, people to notice what you're doing, or sometimes counseling, in, because for African culture, um, being, um, the, the word is not coming now, being ostracized or being um, rejected by society is actually very, very uh, violent to a person. We are very community driven people. And so we understand that. And so we give advice according to, to that understanding, um, you know, giving men, the support and the advice they need how to, on how to withstand the situation. And in cases where women are in unhealthy relationships um, and need to make decisions about whether or not they need to leave their partners in order to, sus to manage their lives, we link them to internal counselors or external counselors to help them in developing a framework um, to help them make the decision. Thank you very much. I think we have probably one more time, uh, one time for one more question before um, we close the talk. Um, this probably builds on to the um, what was just discussed just now, but it's a question from uh, Lama. 
which says, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Could you please tell us how you deal with the social barriers, like the participants of women in such work and industry, which is still considered, especially in men, uh, especially by men. Um, for men, maybe. For men in many countries, yes. Yeah, um, sure. So one of the things we, we do is we only teach high value trades. We only teach trades that are, require a high level of skill and are in demand. And we did that to make sure that women are valued on site. If a worker is coming in to work on a specialized area of, of uh, the project, contractors and employers are more willing to go out of their way to make sure that they are protected so they can focus on that high, high cost, high skill area. Um, and we did this also to change perceptions. If women can do this kind of work, then it defeats the argument on women not being able to cope with high stress or high skill level areas. Um, and those are maybe the two I can think of on the fly. Fantastic, thank you very much. Do, do, you, do you want to maybe try to take one more question from, yeah. uh, from, Cam from Cambridge? Uh, if there Sorry, was yes, we, we do have time for, for a couple more. So. Hi. In a way, you've answered Nick. The, partially the question that I was interested in pressing, but could you say more about the kind of employers who prepared to break with conventions and bring women into both design and the construction processes? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we targeted employers with uh, strong industry reputations contractors and manufacturers who are known to produce high quality uh, level of work efficiently and on time on budget. And this created a, just a different caliber of, of construction company where they're already monitoring their efficiencies, recording where they're wasting time and they're willing to engage in a conversation of how they could possibly do things better. Um, we also uh, just through uh, research, desk research, we go online and we look at companies, construction companies or manufacturers talking about ESG standards or SDGs, because then we can approach them and say, great, you're looking at this area. Well, could you tell us what you're doing? Because we have some uh, you know, suggestions for you. And those just tend to be uh, employers who are more willing to, to engage and, and discuss changes that are needed. Another level of employer that's coming in is um, high craft, high, high skilled and high craft manufacturers, especially, especially of, for homeware and furniture. And these are employers who have just started approaching us in the last year. They don't look to employ our trainees. They rather look to employ artisans who have gone through the four plus eight program, which is a year. And what we are very happy to see, uh, just this year alone, we were able to get a permanent employment uh, in, in very high level roles for our, our alumni artisans with companies which are you know, very based on high, high craft. And that we see is a, is a growing uh, partner who would be able to incorporate our women into their businesses. Great, thank you, thank you very much. And, and really thank you very much for again, this, this, uh, this inspiring uh, talk uh, this uh, and these wonderful reflections on, on on you know ways to to engage women in in so many and 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 paying attention to so many aspects in their lives as part of the process and 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 really to think about you know such intervention which is architectural intervention but 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 also an intervention in so many other uh, aspects of life uh, which are needed in order to to uh, to create the the ground and foundation for. Uh, for such a change, um, I will. Yeah, I will. Thank you again for for this inspiring uh, talking. Yeah, really opening our minds to what we what could be done to promote inclusivity and uh, equality in the built environment, uh, and especially in uh, such a challenging context. Um, and I guess in order to uh, uh, kind of uh, before leaving and 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 um, and and really hoping to. Uh, to continue this this conversation in other ways and and tattoo maybe you can think together on how we can do that because i i know that there are many people in the department who are interested and beyond the department so we'll need to really think about ways to do that uh, i really invite all of you uh who are here this evening to to uh to our next unfold talks this term so two weeks from now we'll have uh, gabriel schwake who uh, will uh give a talk 
um, about uh, decolonizing, uh, about privatized decolon decolonization. And we'll then have Yasmin Lari, architect Yasmin Lari with us. Uh, we'll talk about barefoot social architecture. So really we have um, uh, really promising, uh, fascinating talks before us and, and workshops uh, at the school, at the department. Uh, and yeah, I'll let um, uh, Kim on close and, and maybe Tatu, you want to say something uh, for, for the very end. Um, thank you. I would just like to say thank you for having me. It's, it's, I remember when I was in school and I'd, I'd listened to lectures that just opened my mind and exposed me um, to so much of what was possible in my life. So thank you for allowing me to do this. And to anybody who's listened and you know, has ideas of things they would like to do to promote social justice and equality, my advice would be finding ways that you can work with people um, in, 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 your, in your locale first, because it's good to understand your local context before you try to branch out, and then branch out eventually and just try to learn as much as you can, because that will greatly influence what you're able to do. So thank you so much. Great. So, so, so thank you so much again, Tatu. And we will try to, uh, yes, uh, continue this conversation, uh, this really fascinating conversation in other ways. So thank you everyone for joining us um, today. And we hope to see you two weeks from now in uh, our uh, next talk, Unfold Talk. And just before everyone leaves, um, I just want like if you are a student um, in the Department of Architecture, I'd just like to bring your attention to the workshops that we'll be having concurrently. Um, the first of which will be a drop in um, titled Framing Decolonization in Architecture and Academia. And it will be a whistle stop introduction to the work that we do if you're new to us, um, but also a nice moment for you to catch up um, over the summer and um, discuss what it means to decolonize and whether that's the right word we should be using. So thank you very much again. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, Tatu. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Tatu. Thank you.